Welcome back to the Cover 3 Podcast here on CBS Sports. That's Tom Fernelli. That's CBS Sports Senior College Football Columnist Dennis Dodd. That's Danny Cannell. I'm Chip Patterson. Coming to you live at YouTube.com slash Cover 3 and all across the 24-7 Sports Facebook Network. Thanks for hanging out. Smash that subscribe, smash the like, and come and join us in the chat. Feel free to drop your questions for Dennis Dodd or any one of the rest of us. You get us all the time. We are blessed with the Dodd father here. Uh, if you got any questions for him, be sure to drop them in the chat. Uh, we will uh, grab them, put them to the side, or get the get to them throughout the show. Uh, lots to get to today. Uh, Dennis has a story on CBSSports.com right now which details the top 15 coaches under 40. There are eight head coaches. There are seven coordinators. And we're going to get into some of those individual case-by-case basis, maybe some other names that were considered uh, the coaches on the rise. Plus, uh, what we have learned so far about NIL and Jane Rashada and sort of the lessons the NCAA and college football can learn from that. But, Dennis, let's, let's begin with uh, a look at some spring games, and one spring game in particular. because. This Saturday, the show begins. I mean, the reality show's been taping, right? You know, we've we've seen the reality show go on, but the <laughs> Deion Sanders era at Colorado is going to be the story of college football going into 2023. We've got a, a program that's trying to three-peat, but we're going to be looking out to Boulder. Um, first of all, just what's what's sort of your sense of what Deion Sanders has been able to do so far at Colorado before we get into sort of the larger implications of that? Uh, it's been an A-plus arrival to, to right now, guys. Um, I think in a sense he's kind of hijacked the spring. I know big A-day games, Alabama, Auburn, Florida was <clears throat> kind of a train wreck. It's still a story nonetheless, but this has been constant. In a few short months, he's brought in 42 new faces uh, they're going to sell out the spring game on Saturday, 45,000 people. That's more than the combined attendance of the last nine spring games. ESPN long ago made this case that they're going to show one spring game on their air, the mothership. It's going to be Colorado's. And what would you expect from a guy, Dion, that has done this his whole career, whether as a media analyst, as a talk show host, as a coach, you know, there's never been a player like him. I mean, the, I guess the biggest, best comp is Harbaugh, but Harbaugh isn't a Hall of Famer, at least not yet. You know, Deion Sanders, to me, doesn't need this. And I did a story last fall, like, why is he doing this? Can he coach? And the consensus was, yes, he absolutely can coach. For those who saw him at the FCS Jackson State level, now the ask is bigger. Uh, 1-11 Colorado, worst season in maybe 40 years. But no matter what happens, we're going to watch. It's going to be exciting. And if they go, let's say, five and seven, that almost equates to me what Lincoln Riley did last year, taking USC from four and eight to where they went. Because Colorado, to my sense, guys, is the worst power five program out there. That's going to be very interesting. So what, ESPN is the only one they're showing this season on ESPN. The main network is the Colorado game. They're not sure. They didn't. I mean, I know they didn't show Georgia. They put that stuff on the SEC yeah. network. But. Mm-hmm. Everything else is streaming. a lot of them are streaming. Yeah, That's, you streaming, know, ESPN, ESPN too. Yeah, no, this, this, they made this decision long ago that this was going to be the only one that plays. I mean, they spend all that time talking about the Cowboys and Lakers, no matter how bad they are. So it wouldn't make sense that Colorado is the one team they put on ESPN. But no, so like, I, I, obviously, there's a lot of hoopla surrounding the program because of Dion. But have you heard anything so far as like what the expectations are for like we had Chad Brown on the show a couple months ago, who I thought was very informative on what we were, you know, what, what was going on with the program and what he thought his expectations were and what the expectations were around Boulder. But that was from a local perspective. From a national perspective, what are you hearing about what they are expecting and what they're hoping for in his first year? Well, I think that's the big question mark. I just don't think they're going to crater to one and 11. As I said, five and seven would be a massive improvement. Their schedule's really, really tough. They play Nebraska. They play TCU. I think they've sold out the home opener already for the first time in forever. Um, But I think the expectations are just to improve in a league where, you know, we can talk about the Pac-12 in many angles from here to next Thursday. But without USC and UCLA, that sucker's wide open in the new playoff age for whoever wins it to get to the playoff. It suddenly becomes more easier for a school like Arizona state with, you know, a young 33 year old coach, Kenny Dillingham, a lot of energy 
with Dion to win that league. Oregon and Washington are the two best brands, but USC isn't standing in the way and UCLA isn't there anymore. So I think marginal improvement there would be even uh, would be greeted with uh, with applause. How good they're going to be. He's got talent. He's got new faces. I don't know if they have a quarterback. Uh, Travis Hunter followed him, the number one recruit a couple of years ago at corner from Jackson State. They got Cormani McCormick, I think, to flip from Danny Help like, Me Out, Florida State or Miami or somebody. Florida, um, Miami. Yeah, he yeah. Was, he, both of those two were big on his list. Yeah, yeah, so that that's big. But, you know, can 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 they play? Can he play? Can he coach in the Power Five? One of the things I think that's really – and they're also, by the way, already he's had seven players in the portal, which I think is good. Like, that's what he wants. He wants the players that don't you – know, that aren't yeah. fitting or aren't good enough. His bags are Louie. Louis. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> pack, pack, pack. I thought you said pack the U-E, pack the U-Haul, <laughs> and bring in the Louie is what he wants to do. What, um, so if five and seven is the upside, like if that's a success, I think we'd all agree with that. I think their win total is probably going to be four and a half. What does not a success look like? Is it three wins? Like, is Are we getting to the point where we should expect it to be four to five at minimum? Or like, is there a chance that this – doesn't work because i i'm with you and we've talked a lot about this i think he gets an a plus for the coaching staff he's got guys that were you know head coaches coming to run his offense and defense he's got a recruiting you know um or the prance report with guys you mentioned coming in what if it doesn't work like what if it could like or how would you describe it not working like what would be a failure yeah that's a good point um look colorado's been down for years uh you know i Mike McIntyre, Carl Durrell was such an uninspiring hire. I'm surprised he lasted that long. I'm surprised they hired him. Uh, the Mel Tucker thing, I guess you couldn't do anything about, but it kind of speaks to what Colorado is right now that, you know, Mel Tucker, you know, you can't blame, you can blame his loyalty, but you can't blame him for going to a big 10 school in Michigan state. Um, you know, and how long is Dion interested in that job? What does he want to do? Is it just as, you know, the murmurs are that he just wants to watch his sons get through and play and then do something else, whether it's coach or, or even not even coach anymore, or do something else. So how committed is he to this long term? It looks like Colorado's down, but I think each of them go, goes into it, you know, with wide open eyes that he might be a short timer. Um, again, in a conference where there's hay to be made in an era where you can turn around a program in a year, I think anything less than five wins has to be questioned. Again, it's in a league where you can do some things. He's not doing it uh, in the SEC or Big Ten or something like that. Um, that you can. He's got players that want to be there. He's got coaches that want to be there. And there's already a history of it, sort of, with Lincoln Riley. So can, in, in the, the bigger picture, college sports conference realignment landscape pac 12 trying to get a new media deal the the big 12 maybe maybe not you know putting out the feelers or shooting flares in the sky for what we call the corner schools which of course would be utah colorado arizona arizona state colorado's value in the conference realignment market in the media rights market is that changed at all by Deion sanders can Deion save the pac 12 or can Dion make Colorado even more valuable if the Big 12 or another conference were to come calling? Yeah, I'm writing about that for Friday. Uh, George Klyavkov in, uh, in December in Las Vegas at this, uh, at this college summit that's done every year there. You know, I asked him in, in the hallway, I said, George, does Dion add value to the deal? He said, oh, absolutely. And I started to vet that with consultants. And they said, no, not really. A coach doesn't add you know, uh, value to the deal. Football is football. It's 80% of any media rights contract, but put it this way. It can't hurt. It's bringing eyeballs to Colorado. It's bringing eyeballs to the conference and no, it will not add money to a deal and a pursuit that continues to struggle. Um, in fact, I can tell you that, that Colorado is very interested uh, or has been interested uh, Arizona has been interested. I think those two are probably the leading candidates if they go to the big 12. But that being said, I think all the, the big 12 uh, pac 12 schools are on record as saying, and I believe this to be true. They're going to wait and see what the deal is before they make any decisions. And again, as I've reported, that could be a period of months. So in, in the meantime, we're left with football and Dion uh, and maybe one of the better stories in, uh, in football this year. Do you see any PAC 12 expansion in the near future? 
No, I think that, no, I think, okay. you know, people talk about San Diego State and SMU. I still think you've got to do a deal first before you expand, especially if you're the Pac-12. Um, I don't think you can over, you know, we're going to bring teams in and then see if they're worth the same money because they're not. San Diego State and SMU, if they go to the Pac-12, would probably take something less than 100% of uh, of an annual media rights share, which, you know, that right now the Pac-12 is getting 21 million per year. They think they can get something close to the Big 12, which is right now 31.6 beginning next year. Um, but I think if they were let in, they'd get maybe be offered half because San Diego State only gets four million from the Mountain West. I mean, if it's the Pac-12, I would submit that maybe for who two hundred dollars more a year they would go to the Pac-12, even if it, even if it's injured state. But I think that deal has to come first, and then maybe very quickly expansion, but not the other way around. What about the Big 12 expanding? Because that's something I think that's been rumbling even longer than Pac-12 making moves or, you know, the Arizona, Arizona State, yeah. Colorado, Utah move. And I I mean, I think that's one where I, I don't remember I saw somebody, you know, uh, making, you know, uh, giving their opinion about it, but that all of a sudden Dion of Colorado brings value to the Big 12. Like all of a sudden he's one of these chess pieces in this, you know, big game. What about the Big 12 expanding? Do you think that is a possibility that's on the table? Well, Brett Yormark, the commissioner, remains very aggressive he remains interested but has been told again by you know by these schools that they're going to wait and see uh what kind of deal they get he is telling them that look i may not be here for your lifeline if this deal doesn't come through if it isn't close to what these number the big 12 numbers um 31.6 million per year I, i may move on i mean he's got a secondary plan out there that i think would include san diego state I think you might put UNLV in there because UNLV is a nothing program. Mm -hmm. But I think we all know that Las Vegas is blowing up as a sports mecca and there may be some value there. I think he really, really wants to expand because I think the big picture is whatever it looks like in the future. And I'm not talking breakaway by the Big Ten and SEC, but whatever it looks like, you want to get the most uh, brands under your tent so you can get your nose under that tent. Um, when it comes expanded playoff time and then when and if there is some sort of breakaway because people assume it's going to be uh, the Big Ten and the SEC. I think it could be, but I, I've always said from the beginning, it could be the top 70, the top 80, and the Big 12 wants to be that conference if that's the case. Like, if you want to jump on board to this new future, whatever it looks like, Big 12 saying you get on this train, we're going there. Everybody here is willing to spend is willing to invest. We all want to compete at the highest level. And the, it sounds like Brett Yormark's got some train tickets that he's trying to, to be able to give out. I didn't know about this secondary plan. I didn't know he was saying he's yeah. ready to move on. I mean, this well, is... Well, that's conjecture. On the San Diego State thing, that's been out there, that the Big mm -hmm. 12's interested in San Diego State, but I think San Diego State would prefer the Pac-12. Um, again, uh, that gives him what he wants out of this expansion into the Pacific time zone where he would be... I'm not he, the big 12 would be the only conference across all four time zones. That means a lot in terms of windows to broadcast games. Um, games can be on all day from the, the noon Eastern time slot to late at night. If you've got one of those Western schools and, and, and Gonzaga figures into that too in, uh, in basketball, but I think that's kind of cool. And so on the UNLV front, I think that's, I think that's something they'd be interested in. I've got kind of a list put together for Friday of schools that, the Big 12 hasn't reached out to per se, but when Brett Yormark said we're open for business, he got all these calls, you know, Memphis, UConn, everybody, you know, uh, everybody was calling in to gauge the Big 12's interest. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but I think it's out there. Here, here's what I don't get about all of this, and I don't know that any of us have the answer, but I'm just going to pose the question anyway. Like You mentioned the Big 12 is the schools are getting 31.6 million. He has told, you know, Arizona, Arizona State, the four corner schools are waiting to see what they can get from the Pac-12 before they decide to go to the Big 12. Your mark has said, I might not be your lifeline, et cetera. If the Pac-12 is struggling to get the kind of deal that it's looking for that is in line or better than the Big 12, I understand the concept of adding the extra time zones, but would adding those four corner schools from the Pac-12 bring enough value to the Big 12's overall television deal that it would make it worth to the schools that are currently in the conference 
yeah. were getting 31.6. Like, do those four schools actually bring more value to which they would get more money annually, or would they just not be splitting the pot between more schools? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, you know, I talked to the stakeholders in some of this, and other words, would would ESPN and Fox pay for? You know, it's called pro rata, at least mm -hmm. equal value to what the Big Twelve schools are getting for those schools. And you hear both, you know, from the Big Twelve. Oh yeah, we've got this wrapped up. They've committed. Well, from some of those stakeholders, maybe not. Um, but again, I think they come if the number's low enough from the Pac-12 at some sort of percentage of a full deal, where then you can be grandfathered in and gain value. I can't remember the exact amount of years, but it took Nebraska a few years to get a full share mm -hmm. from the Big Ten when they went. West Virginia took a few years. Um, I don't think Maryland went, and Rutgers it, are getting a full share yet either. Right. Rutgers, yeah. Rutgers took a few years. And I've heard critics in the Big 12 say that, um, hey, look, the TCU and um, – and West Virginia, they gave them a full share too soon, you know, in, in the crippled state that the Pac-12 was in. If they come, it would be, OK, you can come, but at X. So, um, no, I, I don't know if they would get a full share. It would be a lifeline to be in a major conference at that point. I thought you hit on something interesting there because you said there's this, you know, the, the idea of the Big Ten and the SEC super conference. You know, do they add and do we get somewhere, you know, 30? 32, 40, whatever those teams are. And you said we could be in this, you know, 70 to 80 range. Is that, is that big 12 pack? Is that like the similar look? Like the ACC is kind of in this position that was stuck. Yeah. I know there's some saber rattling from Clemson and Florida state, not that long ago, but is that becoming a more viable, you know, outcome, which I think is, I think it's kind of just kicking the can down the road because uh, ultimately, like you're not going to be able to compete with the teams in the Big Ten and the SEC because of the money they can spend. But at least you have this appearance of, well, we're still, everyone's still a part of it, but they might not really be there. Is that becoming more of a reality, though, you think? Yeah, uh, I think I think the thing that binds it together, that makes it doable, at least in the near future, is the expanded playoff. Everybody's going to have access. Um, but I do think, and I'm going to write about this later in the year, there's going to be a moment or an inflection point or some subject where the SEC and or the Big Ten flex. They're going to say, uh, you know what, instead of 25 scholarships, we're going to give 35 or, you know what, we've got enough media rights money that we're going to cut off a chunk for revenue sharing for the players. And I don't know the details. And I, I, yes, I know there'd be implications in Title IX and all that. I mean, I, I don't know about those right now. But there's going to be a moment where that happens. Maybe the courts decide for the NCAA that they're employees. You know, what does that look like? And what, talk about competition for talent. Um, those two conferences would have it. But I think in some respects that... I think there'd be about 70 or 80 teams under the tent just to make it more compelling. Maybe not. You know, Greg Sankey said, was it a year or two years ago that we could stage our own our own playoff? It didn't look feasible, but you know what? He's right. Uh, somebody pay a lot of money for those, whatever it is, 16 teams right now, because uh, say, say what you want, those 32 teams right now and those two conferences have the biggest, best legacy brands in college football mm -hmm. history. And that's not going away. It's just a question to me of what they're going to do to weaponize it and monetize it. I, I don't know if uh, Danny's ever been in this position, you know, just being a you know, superstar from day one. But I don't know if I've, I've been been parts of groups where you're trying to decide where to go to dinner. Right. You're trying to decide what we're going to do tonight. And there's somebody in the group that wants to go a little big, you know, wants to, and the, maybe you got to back off. Maybe you got to step back and say, I can't do that. And to your point, Dennis, there's might be a who got it moment. And maybe it's scholarships. Maybe it's coaching pools. Like maybe it is breaking off money for the players. But like if you want to find out the the line in the sands between who wants to compete in the big time college football moving forward, I agree with you. I think it's probably going to be something that comes down to who has the money or who is willing to spend the money to be able to keep up. So should be how about how about the this one that was it last week? Unlimited visits and recruiting, that blew me away. Um, I started making calls about that. That's going to be huge. I texted mm -hmm. June Johnson, the old coach at Hawaii. He still lives out there. I said, how did you get guys to come there? Because you had, when there were 
you know, the visitations were limited. You had to figure out who was just trying to take a vacation and who was generally interested in coming to Hawaii. And he said, we'd wait till the very last minute when guys had no other options. And we knew they were serious about Hawaii. But how does that look now? Georgia, I think you guys saw the story, has a recruiting budget of $4.5 million, $2 million more than Alabama. What are they spending it on? That's a lot of swag copters, guys. And then the price of poker with that ruling just went up. Private jets. That's what they're spending it on. Like, yep. we, got, we had Mike Gundy on. Their budget last year was like 450 yeah. grand. I mean, it's insane the disparity that's out there. I did take a uh, – I had five visits. You know, the limits were there. And I went to Washington and Seattle, which was exactly the furthest, the furthest place I could go in the country to go. I just wanted to go to the West Coast. And they had just won the national championship right. like the couple year before. So I get out there and Damon Heward is my host. And so we get in the car and it's always kind of awkward because I would be competing with him and, you know, what, what would happen there? And, you know, he picks me up from the airport and he's showing me around. He's like, would you really come out here? I was like, no, nah, no. Nah. I'm like, I, there's no chance. And he's like, all right, let's have some fun. And we had a blast. <laughs> we had a great weekend. But I knew all along I was just doing it for a trip to the West Coast. And man, if I would have known Hawaii was there, I might have taken oh. if that one was in play. I would have taken a visit yeah. there too. You were just putting a scare into your parents. Like, I might go to <laughs> Seattle for school. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Threaten them. Yeah. <laughs> Coming up on the other side, we are seeing a real youth movement in college football coaching. Coaches have gotten younger than ever over the course of the last 10 years, so much so that we've got a star studded group of coaches under 40. Dennis on CBSSports.com has collected the 15 top coaches under 40 entering the 2023 season. We'll get into that list and more. Yeah. CBS Sports Galazzo Network, the first of its kind free 24-7 channel dedicated exclusively to global soccer coverage is now streaming on the CBS Sports app, Pluto TV, and Paramount+. Plus. Get your morning started off with On the Right Foot with Morning Footy, our weekday soccer culture-driven morning show beginning at 7 a.m. Eastern Time. Plus, don't miss the rest of our top-notch programming, including live matches and re-airs, original studio shows, highlights, documentaries, and so much more. It's the CBS Sports Galazzo Network, streaming now on the CBS Sports app, Pluto TV, and Paramount+. Plus. You're watching live. Of course, remember, we've got more Champions League action coming up uh, today. Sorry, Why'd Tom. you have to bring that up? I'm sorry, Tom. Doing Europa best, League, a brave face. Euro, Europa League on Thursday and Europa Conference League for uh, for those still in the mix uh, also on Thursday. Lots of coverage around that on the CBS Sports Galazzo Network available on the CBS Sports app, Paramount Plus and Pluto TV. Dennis, you've been you've had your eye on the youth movement for a little bit because we go from uh, oh my goodness, like Lincoln Riley is the youngest head coach at the FBS and then they get younger and then they get younger and then there's a Dan Lanning and then there's a Kenny Dillingham and all of a sudden we've got a, a pretty significant collection of coaches. So before we start to pick uh, a couple of these names individually, did you notice any themes when you were starting to pull together uh, the top 15 coaches under 40 for this season? Yeah, the idea last year we did the top 10 uh, head coaches under 45. And instead of doing that again, you know, again, you're going to have the same old names on there. Lincoln Riley's on this list. He was on that list. Um, we decided to pare it down and just include all coaches, uh, coordinators, head coaches, everybody, and see who we could pull together. And it, it was, it was really interesting. Obviously Lincoln, uh, Lincoln Riley is on there. Kenny Dillingham though, the youngest coach in the country at Arizona state, um, a guy who, if he succeeds, is going to retire their native son, um, never played college football because of a high school injury, but as a student at ASU was already coaching high school ball, not a head coach an assistant coach, but his energy is undeniable there. And he could be the next guy. Um, Alex Golish at, uh, at South Florida, 38 years old. I think now I was Danny, I don't know about you. I was a bit surprised he took that job. It's not a good job on its surface. And he might've been better served by staying at Tennessee another year and maybe getting something better. But um, he's part of that youth movement. Um, overall, the numbers don't really say it. Last year, the average age of new coaches 
coming in. We're 43 years old. I think this year it's 46.6 or something like that. But I think the inclusion of putting these coordinators in gives you a pretty good idea of who, who the next guys could be. Dennis, I saw, I'm curious to know, because you mentioned Dillingham and it sounds like you were there, right? You were at Phoenix for their spring game. Yeah. yeah. Um, so when I talked to him, I talked to him at the Super Bowl. He sat down with us and he was actually, they had just found out about Rashada and the, all the stuff that was going on with him. And they were talking about excited, but I left that like just interaction with him. And I talked to him when he was at Florida state, but like it really was glaring. And I don't know how much time he spent with Mike Norvell, but he was almost a clone of Norvell, yeah. like the energy, high energy, fast talker, positivity. And then I noticed what he did at the spring game was something that he took, I believe from, you know, it was Mike Norvell's idea to have the celebrity coaches, you know, yeah. coach up the spring game. And he brought in the guys from the, the Barstool podcast to have them, you know, coach the spring game. But I, that's where I do look at, it. I, I, I see a Mike Norvell clone, um, but he's younger than Norvell was. And he's in ex more ex inexperienced than Norvell was he came in there from Memphis is he getting? Is he going to get a pretty long leash there at Arizona State because of you know some things that have happened? Because he's a hometown kid, because he went there, uh, and maybe or does he need a long leash? Maybe he doesn't. Yeah, as I mentioned before, you know the Pac-12 is somewhat wide open now with the loss of those two teams. But I I was surprised number one that Ray Anderson was allowed to keep his job to make the hire. You know, they're in, let's be honest, Arizona State's still involved in a major NCA investigation. Herm Edwards or whoever were bringing in kids uh, as recruits during COVID during the dead period, among other things. But I thought he made the exact right hire. Uh, Kenny, Kenny Dillingham wants to be there. <clears throat> Excuse me. At the age of 33, he's already been a coordinator at uh, offensive coordinator, four FBS schools, three power fives. Um, he told me an interesting story when I was writing about him that he's got all these former quarterbacks in his phone that he keeps in touch with. Well, he's put them on a text chain. Uh, they now talk to each other. So the Florida State quarterback is talking to some of the old quarterbacks. He had a Memphis, some of the other quarterbacks that he had, and they all talk together. I thought it was really, really interesting. Um, and he's one of those guys that's, yes, is a ball of energy. I really like that he's brought in Bo Baldwin, who was a proven commodity as a head coach at Eastern Washington and F FCS. Um, they're going to pitch it around a little bit. But I think he's really established for age 33. And I, I, I think he's a guy, as I mentioned up top, that I think could retire there if he gets this thing going. Yeah, you mentioned Alex Galish at South Florida. You know, he, he, came, he came from Tennessee and you were surprised by it. I was a little surprised by it, too. I wondered, honestly, if part of it was just how far down on its list South Florida got. But I think Golish is a guy I'm familiar with. Because, you know, he was in Champaign. He was on Tim Beckman's staff. Yeah. In Illinois. He was like a tight ends coach recruiting coordinator, I think was his title at the time. But he has been somebody. He moved on to Iowa State. So he was on Matt Campbell's staff as somebody who helped build that program and saw, you know, because Iowa State was really hadn't been anything super special. I mean, they had some success under Paul Rhodes. But what Matt Campbell was able to do with it in that staff is taking it to a completely different level. He goes to Tennessee. He gets experience in a different offense, sees Josh Heupel kind of build up the program so while it was surprising to me and i think it is a very big challenge because i do think that in the american right now like that's a program the last few years is just kind of it yeah. used to be looked at as something of a you know like a, a sleeping giant or whatever if you want to call it but it's kind of fallen off but i do think that with the experience he's had at iowa state building that program with the offense he was learned like it was a surprising hire but i do think that is a hire that could work out because there is talent in that area and there's a lot of talent that kind of fits into the mold of that offense so that is a really interesting hire to me too yeah, it, it, it should, it should, he should succeed. But, you know, you look at Charlie Strong didn't work out. Mm -hmm. Jeff Scott didn't work out. They're right in the middle of that Florida talent. They put money into facilities. Um, so I hope it works out. He's a fascinating guy to me. Uh, uh, Alex was born in Russia. He's a Russian mm -hmm. citizen. His, his parents are from Russia. They got out because of communism or whatever and were able to come to this country. I think it was in 2017 when he was at Iowa State the previous year. The tight ends had caught four passes, and the next year, maybe Charlie Kohler, or maybe in pre, uh, subsequent years, caught, caught seven. The tight ends caught seventy-five, mm -hmm. and Charlie Kohler won the uh, won the academic Heisman, um, uh, the Campbell Award, I think it is. So he's had an impact wherever he's gone, and we haven't even we gotten this far and haven't even mentioned what he did with Hendon Hooker, which has been fantastic. No the other thing doubt. too, he's got. 
one of the, one of the good things they got going for them is they're going to the American or they're in the American. The American just lost four of their best schools, so it should should get easier to compete and be competitive in there. Uh, last week I talked to Ryan Walters at Illinois. I was really impressed with him. He felt like an up and comer, up and comer who finally gets the opportunity uh, to go to Purdue. Um, he's and he's inheriting a pretty good situation. You know, back to back, you know, eight or nine win seasons for the Boilermakers. I thought it was interesting. He brings in Graham Harrell to run the offense to stay aggressive on the offense side of the ball Hudson card but that's going to come with some pretty big expectations what do you think of the uh, Ryan Walters to Purdue I thought it was great I'm, I'm glad he got that job uh, he was nearby here where I am at Missouri and really made a uh, an impact in the short time he was there with Eli Drinkowitz and they weren't able to keep him very long last year at Illinois uh with Brett Bielma, they were 97th, I think, in in total offense or scoring or total defense or scoring defense. I can't remember which. Last year led the country in scoring defense, 12.8 points per game. Again, in the Big Ten, but Illinois had a resurgence. Um, I think at Purdue, he can keep it going with Jeff Brom as did from the other side of the ball. Um, in an age when offensive coaches are being hired, I don't know what the percentage is, but vastly over 50% for head coaches these days, I think he gets it. Um, I think he's at a place that's put money into it. You know, they paid Jeff Brom scats, you know, uh, huge amounts of money. Look, look at his record though, after he beat Ohio state on that famous night game where mm -hmm. um, they, I think Ohio state was number two at the time. He was a 500 coach. That's not to say you can't win at Purdue, but it's going to take a lot of work. And obviously they played, in the, in the big 10 championship game last year, but as an eight and four team and then got waxed. But I think there's a lot of upside for Ryan Walters. I think he's a great defensive coach. Yeah. Like he just watched the draft next week. Cause like it's, he's coming from Illinois. They had Kirby Joseph. He took over. Kirby Joseph was recruited under Lovey Smith was kind of somebody that they didn't really know what to do with. Walters is a defensive coordinator last year, pretty much changes the scheme that they started the year with during the middle of the season. Kirby Joseph finds a spot as a free safety, is drafted by the Lions, and has been played very well for the Lions. They're very happy with him. And now this year in the draft, Devin Witherspoon might be a top 10 pick. Sidney Brown, another one of Ryan Walters' defensive backs, is expected to go. Quan Martin, another one of his defensive backs, is expected to go. So on the defensive side of the ball, he played a big part in developing a lot of very good defensive backs, which Purdue, you, like you mentioned, under Jeff Brom, like they had good defense. Like George Karloftis was a very good player. They've had good defensive players, but they have not had a great defense, and a lot of that has been in the secondary. So I think that if nothing else, like bringing in the Herald to kind of run the offense. And yeah. we see that a lot. A lot of defensive coordinators take over jobs as head coaches for the first time, and they just want to get in dumb rock fights and try to win games 14 to 13. By hiring Harrell, he's, <laughs> it sends the message like, no, we're going to try to score 40 points a game and give up 14 points per game. So I, I, I like a lot of what he's done. I loved what he did at Illinois. And I thought it was a very good hire for Purdue. And I think they're off. By the way, here's there. a good trivia here. Uh, the, he is the first defensive coach hired at Purdue mm -hmm. since, since guess who? Joe Tiller. Joe Tiller. Who is anything but a, but a defensive legacy in the game and at Purdue uh, in 1987. So there's something to be said for that. There are, again, eight head coaches, seven assistants. There are two defensive coordinators on Dennis Dodd's list of top 15 coaches under 40, and one of them is one of the youngest on the list, 33-year-old Glenn Schumann, the co-defensive coordinator at Georgia. Now, Kirby Smart has, is seeing exactly what Nick Saban dealt with at Alabama, where you're running this fantastic program, everybody wants a piece. He loses Dan Lanning. He loses Todd Munkin. Glenn Schumann at 33, you know, a lot of, you know, what you're doing behind the scenes, especially when we get down into coach hiring and firing time is trying to get a sense for who are the names on this list. Do you think that when we reach the end of the 2023 regular season, Glenn Schumann is popping up as a, one of these top candidates from a, a school that is looking to get a piece of Georgia's success? Yeah. How, how can he not be a back-to-back -back national championships? Obviously he was part of a, coaching staff that had to replace five number one draft choices, a record 15 overall last year. Um, and now has helped tremendously in the development of Nolan Smith, Jalen Carter, who's going to go high despite the, the legal troubles. Um, and I would expect him to be maybe the hottest guy coming out of the next season. Again, only 33, got Nick Saban on his resume, got Kirby Smart on his resume. 
a great schemer, co-defensive coordinator with Will Muschamp. So it's like Lennon and McCartney in that defensive room, um, you know, dialing up plays for the SEC. And I, I should, I, I need to drop this before, before we get out of here. Georgia has nobody's talking about this. Georgia has a very realistic chance to three peat. Um, I know they're replacing. I know they're replacing a former walk-on quarterback. We are talking about this. It's like yeah. the biggest like yeah, okay, okay, good, good. You guys, are, yeah, <laughs> you guys are on the cutting edge. Um, but gosh, I mean, look at their. You, you have looked at their schedule. Their schedule is charm and soft. It starts in November. Yes. They can, yes. They, they yes. can run a quarterback competition through the first eight weeks of the season and let you could alternate games and they yeah. could probably be seven and zero. Oh. And so by Dennis. that time, um, you know, half the staff at Georgia is going to be in the in the presidential primary in 24. Forget about college coaching. They're going to be that hot. Dennis Dabo at Clemson would get furious when the conversation started, ooh, if you lose a game, you're out because it's too light. Like, you don't play enough people in the ACC and you don't have enough player. Should we be having that conversation about Georgia? Like, if they lose a game with that slate. Yeah. Uh, it depends on who and when, just like all of this. Uh, I think I would think they'd get the benefit of the doubt. They definitely um, would. We all know yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, after, you know, if they lose late or lose in the championship game or something like that. Um, maybe even two, I don't know, maybe I'm being out of line, but, uh, they've done so much. And that look, I, I started writing it the night of the championship game. This is the new dynasty. There can be others going on parallel, but this is the best and the newest right now. It has no signs of slowing down. Kirby's not going anywhere. Um, guys are leaving the program, but I, and I, I keep coming back to the fact they had, what was it? They had no transfers last year. I think they lost guys. Right. They had nobody in like they did not yes. get anybody into the program from the portal on last year's roster. Yeah. So 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 all all home baked pies sitting there on the windowsill cooling for the dog. They didn't have to bring any uh, imported ingredients. Yeah. But what about the uh, the names that were do you have any names that were close to this list, but maybe either because of age or just because you needed to draw a line at 15 other ones to watch? I had a discussion with my editor about Pete Golding and I had him on there and took him off. He was the whip, the latest whipping boy at Alabama, 39 years old. I think you got to give him credit for the guys he's coached and coached up. I mean, he's got Will Anderson Jr. on his resume right now. He's got a championship ring. Um, and I think uh, Alabama, I know Alabama finished third in the, in the SEC in defense last year. I know it wasn't up to their standards, but this is a guy that now at Ole Miss, uh, Kirby, you know, uh, Lane called him a championship caliber coach. I mean, you know, that's saying something from Lane. Of course, hyperbole reigns at any time when you're doing this. But I, I just like the guy. I think I think he's done a lot there. I think there's a standard at Alabama that exists in its own bubble sometimes. And if he was the latest guy to be run out of town there for not uh, under for not achieving, I think they lost a good one. You got Josh Gaddis on there. Another one who got Josh Gaddis. Yeah. You get yeah. how run much out of damage was him. done to his, like he was a rising star. Our, uh, the Bro Broyles award, not our Broyles award winner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Arb if they name Broyles it after award Broyles, winner. there's going to be trouble. <laughs> <laughs> then he goes to Miami and he's given a quarterback who was, you know, all the rage in the yeah. ACC doesn't work out. He's fired after one year with Mario. How much damage is, is that did that hit him with? And I, I'm curious yeah. to know why I think it didn't work. Yeah, it, it 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 remains to be seen. I don't know why it didn't work. I think the blame has to go around there at Miami. I don't think it was a jo just a Josh Gaddis thing. You know, I I think it was a qu a quarterback thing. I think it was a Mario thing. Um, it's inexcusable to get run up by Middle Tennessee at home. I think they were one and five at home. And yeah, maybe he was a victim of all that. He he wasn't the only one to leave, but he's in a very comfortable place with Loxley, Mike Loxley at Maryland. Uh, they had paired together, I think, at uh, at Alabama when he was there. So I, I think he'll rebound. Um, I, I think Maryland will be better. Uh, Miami can't help but be better. But maybe that <clears throat> maybe that was just a bad fit. People say Mario is hard to work for. Excuse me. <clears throat> Every coach is hard to work for. Nick's hard to work for. They're all hard to work for. So I don't want to hear that. Um, but I still think he's young enough, as you mentioned, um, to make a heck of a career for himself. And, um, you know, what he did in his previous stops, uh, especially at Michigan, you know, I think was impressive as well. 
This isn't even, this isn't a question. It was just a comment because when I was reading it this morning, I was just, it made me laugh to myself because when I saw Lincoln Riley was still only 39 on the list, I think, I think it says something about how the profession is going in that. Cause I first became aware of Riley like 10 years ago when he was the offensive coordinator at Eastern East Carolina. So for me to think that he's still like, he feels like an old ancient coach at this point, yeah. considering all he accomplished at Oklahoma and now what he's doing at USC. It's like, the see, he's like, wait, he's still only 39. What the hell is going on these days? Yeah. Cause I feel like it's, it's only a matter of time before this list becomes, instead of it being the 15 coaches under 40 soon, it's going to be the 15 coaches under 30. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, it, it could be. I mean, guys like Josh Heupel aged out of this list. You know, you can't put him on there anymore. There was a couple of others I can't remember. But Lincoln Riley, I, I was there that summer when he got uh, when he got promoted at age mm -hmm. 33 and Bob Stoops retired. And then I started looking around. Let's see, at age 32, Bear Bryant was a head coach. That's a different age, different time, but it is possible. And Lincoln Riley at that tender age already has what three CFP appearances, three yeah. or four big 12 titles probably should have won and gotten to the CFP last year, but the turnaround in itself was amazing and won another Heisman. So in many ways, he's got his whole career ahead of him. I mean, tw mm -hmm. you know, 25 or 30 years more of Lincoln Riley if he wants it. So yeah, that that's impressive. And another guy I wanted to mention um, real quick, cause he really stood out is, uh, is his brother. Garrett Riley, who's now at Clemson, I think that's one of the biggest gets of the offseason in terms of assistant coaches. What was wrong with Clemson? La wrong with Clemson last year? Well, they weren't the same with DJ Uangalele in the in the offense struggled. Garrett Riley was a savant last year. Uh, you know, while while the the meter's running, he has to go in and get Max Dugan ready, and Max Dugan becomes a Davy O'Brien Award winner, a Heisman finalist. I don't have to tell you what he accomplished leads TCU to the championship game. A lot of that is on Garrett Riley and he is, they are, they are as close as you can get his brothers from Mule Shoe, Texas. I think that's going to be bare something to watch. I think just his scheming um, with Cade Klubnik alone and what they with, with Will Shipley alone will pay off dividends for Clemson this year. I will make the prediction. Younger. Go ahead. I, gonna, I will make the prediction there's no way that Lincoln Riley is still coaching in 25 years. What's he making, 11 million a season? Oh, no way. No. Yeah, that's, another, that's another part of this is like coaches yeah. are going to also start retiring earlier, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we're seeing it all across college sports. The money's so good. It's like pff, 365 days of recruiting or counting these checks. Uh, See you in the Maldives, fellas. <laughs> They're getting younger and younger. Did you guys? I don't know if we'll ever see him this young. Uh, Chip may know the story. The UNC women's field hockey head coach, 22 years old. Right off she the team. She went straight from play. Yeah, right off the team. There was like an issue with the coach that like got fired. And so she stepped right in, 22. I don't know if we'll ever she get still that. Still have crazy. eligibility? <laughs> no, she's done. I mean, with she's the COVID done. year, she might and still she have was eligibility. Like Four time All American, like unbelievable player, but she took over uh, right there. There's a, there's a 28 year old um, woman at Florida who's, uh, I think her name is Katie Turner. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, who's uh, not chief of staff, but like in charge of recruiting or something like that. And her name came up for this thing. Now, I wasn't going to put her on when the 15 we've got. Obviously, she's not an on field coach, but it's those types of opportunities. Um, that you're getting into. Lincoln Riley has uh, has a woman that he brought with him who does just the same thing at USC. So my question is the big question: How soon till we see, you know, a woman as a coordinator, a woman as a head coach? They're already in the NBA, obviously, as referees in the NFL, even in the NCAA. That's the moment I'm waiting for because that's going to happen too. Yeah, Katie Turner, uh, Alabama graduate, linked yep. up with uh, Billy Napier at Louisiana, spent two years with Kirby Smart at Georgia, and is now back at Florida with Billy Napier. Um, interesting how the the role of a staff continues to expand. You want to keep talking about the line in the sand on what you're willing to spend. The the staffing is, is much more than just the on-field coaches in the modern college football world. Well, coming up on the other side, Last week, one of the big stories of the week was the hiring of the Big Ten's next commissioner. And Dennis got to talk to some of the people that have worked with him all along the way. What should we expect from the hire and the Big Ten moving forward? That and more next
A Paramount Plus subscription is now included with your Walmart Plus membership. Tell the world what happens when they cross me. For no additional cost, members get a mountain of entertainment. Are you accusing me of something? This is great! Sign up for a Walmart Plus membership and watch all of this and more with your Paramount Plus subscription. I'm gonna trust you on this. Back here on the Cover 3 podcast, very much uh, pleased to have Dennis Dodd joining us for the show. Always love uh, check-ins with the Dodd father. So the Big Ten commissioner is just without even a name associated with it, going to be one of the most important people in all of college sports. We find out that as Kevin Warren is going to be stepping away, uh, taking a new role with the Chicago Bears, the Big Ten university presidents, uh, whoever their decision-making body is, I assume it's the collection of presidents, they have tapped. Tony Petiti to be the next commissioner. And that was a little bit of discussion here on the Cover 3 podcast. You wrote about the hire late last week, Dennis. Um, what's your sense in terms of who Tony Petiti is and what he is bringing to the Big Ten? Well, the first reaction was, well, here we go again with another non-traditional hire. Um, he's the fourth consecutive Power 5 commissioner from outside, I guess, the athletic realm. But now what was non-traditional is now traditional. The top four of the top six conferences, if you include Mike Oresco at the American, now come from the TV marketing uh, space, from outside college football, outside college athletics. So this is becoming the norm. Um, somebody in the piece made the reference to, well, it's, it's all about football and maximizing football revenue. Who's more important than that than these programmers? And, and Tony Petiti his history goes back years, 1988, or not, I'm sorry, 1998. He was basically responsible at ABC for bringing the Big Ten Pac-10 then and the Rose Bowl together so we could have the BCS. And if we didn't have the BCS, we wouldn't have the college football playoff. Um, he was a programmer at CBS with Sean McManus, the president of CBS Sports. He worked with Mike Oresco on the tournament golf, football, um, knows this thing inside and out. In one sense, look, Tony Petiti, I think he's about 63 years old, uh, is in a rocking chair. Kevin Warren, for better or worse, whatever credit you want to give him, the TV deal is done. The record TV deal is done. Um, they're not going to expand, in my opinion, for the next few years. So, you know, what does he have to do there? I think we're going to see things like Brett Yormark has kind of proposed Brett Yormark wants to have an, a series of exhibition basketball games in Rucker Park. He was on a podcast recently, and this is no secret because it's public now. He wants to have a Big 12 concert tour. These are the kind of things Tony Petiti, from my research, thinks about. I think it will take some getting used to in the Big Ten because they are a little bit staid and conservative. But I think anything to maximize the revenue and stay ahead of, we're talking about the power too, they're still ahead of the SEC, which makes him the de facto most powerful guy in sports, right? You mentioned that, you know, he his background in television will be important because as you wrote in your piece or as the others told you in the piece, like just because the deal is done doesn't mean you're done dealing with the network that yeah. you have to deal with. So you need somebody to deal with that. But do you think there's also a part of this hire in which he served as the COO of MLB, which was he yeah. replaced Rob Manfred as that COO when Rob Manfred became commissioner. One of the responsibilities, at least that Manfred had as he was COO, and I don't know if Petiti had the same role, but was dealing with labor relations. Is his is his past with MLB as part of the COO maybe a sign of something coming in the future where if college football keeps going the direction it's going and maybe players sort of, you know, at some point become employees, is his past working with MLB and possibly dealing with labor relations another reason behind his hire? That's a great point, Tom. And I, the one I hadn't even thought of. Yes, it can't hurt. Um, and that goes back to my point that I mentioned earlier about what happens when the SEC and or the Big Ten flex, um, you know, and they make these players partners in some kind of way. Because I think I think ADs across the country think that's inevitable. Um, yeah, Tony Petiti was, was involved in that. He started, basically started the MLB network. He was Rob Manfred's number two guy. I mean, I, I should mention his experience at the time he was hired at the Big Ten. He was at the 33rd team, which was a content provider, um, an NFL kind of content provider 
um, before that, or maybe a- subsequent to that, uh, Activision Blizzard, which was a, mm-hmm. uh, basically a gaming platform. So look, unrelated to anything we're really talking about now. So his, his, uh, his experience is vast. And he's one of those guys that everybody knows. I had always known his name at CBS, had never met him, but also knew he was very important and very powerful at the network. So for him to be interested in this job at this point in his career, I think is significant. Yeah, that's the way I've always felt about Dennis Dodd too. I never really, you know, heard his name and always knew he was really powerful and sort of in control. <laughs> All right, you you say ADs across the country are expecting that. Is that? Like, that we, yeah. That's, I feel like we can say that, but you're sitting there talking to athletic directors and athletic directors are accepting what I think that the fans think is still just like pie in the sky, you know, throwing ideas on the wall, brainstorming. That's that, that is, I guess, good to know that they're planning ahead because maybe unlike name, image, and likeness, you won't just get all of a sudden caught. Like, <laughs> Oh, I guess this is the rules now where like it, it's weird that they might have some foresight instead of being reactionary, but at least if they're thinking about it, we could at least hope that it's going to be a, a structure that's going to end up making sense for everybody involved. Yeah. I, I don't even know if they're planning it. It, it may be forced upon them and, and, and they may not like it, but I think they're resigned to it. And I'm just, I'm just talking about the vibe I'm getting. I right. know, like mm-hmm. Bubba, Bubba Cunningham is out there as one of a significant AD at North Carolina, who I think kind of feels that way. He feels this, you know, the traditional NCA model slipping away doesn't, you know, necessarily, he doesn't necessarily like it, but he's got to get in line and take care of North Carolina athletes, no matter what that looks like. And again, the courts may be, it may be forced upon them by the courts and some of these big time cases. Two weeks ago, a a case was filed by Chubba Hubbard, the old Oklahoma state um, running back and another are the plaintiffs uh another class action suit to re- try to get, regain money from the past uh they're the johnson and house lawsuits one of them uh, originating in pennsylvania is trying to make uh players re- involved in revenue sharing um so it, it looks like it's going to happen unless charlie baker is successful on the field getting some kind of state preemption or antitrust exception from congress which again i wrote about it's going going to post today about that. There just seems to be no momentum for that. I think he's made a a good faith effort to do so, but that, I don't know if you guys saw that, that, uh, that hearing a couple of weeks ago, it was the energy and commerce subcommittee hearing on NIL. And it was the first one since Charlie Baker took office. That was a significance. Well, it was, it it was real, a a real dud. You had one of the subcommittee members up there in a, in a, from Georgia, a representative in a red coat saying, go dogs, uh, he had autographed Georgia football, didn't know what he was talking about when he would ask questions. The only commissioner on the panel among the witnesses was <clears throat> the Patriot League commissioner, which sponsors FCS football. None of the Power Five commissioners were there. So if that's a slice of where this is headed, um, you know, there is no consensus right now. Mm. Very interesting. All that, again, you can check it out on cbssports.com. Top 15 coaches under 40 up there uh, right now as you are watching us live. And thank you to everybody who's watching us live. A little bit later today, some name, image, and likeness. I know you got a chance to talk to Jaden Rashada. That'll be very interesting. We'll keep our tabs, our eyes out for that. And uh, Colorado plays a role. Busy week for the Dodd Father at cbssports.com. Be sure to check it all out. And you can. Follow him on Twitter at Tom Fernelli. You can follow him at Dennis Dodd CBS. You can follow him at Danny Cannell. You can follow me at Chip underscore Patterson. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. You got it.